What an amazing, amazing day. Can I, um, I thought maybe there would be like an afternoon break and we'd all have a chance to eat coffee, uh, drink coffee and eat cookies, but would you all just stand up for like three seconds so everyone can like get out of their seats for three seconds and then. Okay, not schmooze, don't laugh at someone, don't introduce yourself, just sit down again. You may have noticed when you were standing up that uh, someone has stolen David Meerman Scott's astronaut backpack. I blame the dog. Uh, and uh, I also should say I've been looking at the big letters and if they don't have any plans for these big letters after today, I want to take them home and I was going to rearrange them because I noticed that you can also make them say uh, sexed, mustard, and shame, uh, which is, for me, that's like a typical Saturday night. So I'm going to just, I'm going to do that. At, Okay, it's good to know I'm among kindred spirits here at UMass. Um, I love the movies. Would you applaud if you love the movies? Great. And um, I was also kind of a technology nerd. I grew up before you guys did in the 70s and 80s, and so my first computer came from Radio Shack, and my second was an Apple IIe, um, you know, and learned to write basic on those machines. Uh, but I, I always have been a movie buff, and so one day a couple years ago I got this phone call that said George Lucas wants someone to collaborate with him on a book project to understand the history of technologies and the, the cinema and the movies. And so uh, I quickly said yes, I got my ass on a plane and uh, went to Northern California to kind of see what he had in mind. And it turned out that his interest really was um, in this strange and twisted relationship that Hollywood has every time someone tries to introduce a new technology, introduce innovation in the movie industry. And he very much has been part of that story. And it was a, it was a great project, and I want to share some of what I learned uh, with you today. If we go back to the 19th century, these two guys were kind of like the Bill Gates and the Steve Jobs uh, of that era. Do you recognize either of them? Say it aloud if you know who they are. Edison. What about the other guy? Kodak. Yeah, it was George Eastman from Kodak. Everyone knows Thomas Edison on the right. He invented one of the earliest movie cameras. Uh, but you couldn't have had the movies if you didn't have George Eastman and Kodak. They, they were a company that made film, for some of you who don't remember that, and, and cameras that went snap, snap. Uh, so uh, George Eastman invented flexible celluloid film. You know, before that, in the era of the Civil War, you had photography on glass plates, which you couldn't really run through a movie camera. And Edison also designed this, uh, this movie viewing device called a kinetoscope. And it wasn't for showing movies to a big group of people. It was kind of like a personalized viewing device. You would look into a little window in that upper left-hand corner. There was a, uh, these spools and a loop of film and a light bulb. And you would basically get to watch a 30-second movie, um, kind of goofy slice of life. There wasn't really much of a story to it. It was kind of like YouTube uh, in the 19th century. And uh, this is really the beginning of the movie industry with Thomas Edison and George Eastman and the kinetoscope. And uh, I'll give you an example of kind of what you might have seen if you went into a kinetoscope parlor in the 1890s. Um, this is a Mexican tightrope walker. It's not known whether he uh, had any children. Uh, but this is one of the first movies that was made in Edison's lab in uh, Menlo Park, New Jersey. And the kinetoscope was really a huge hit. Um, it, it really was the iPhone of its day, and they started opening up these kinetoscope parlors all around the world, in New York and San Francisco and London, and you'd pay 25 cents, you'd go in, you'd look at a series of movies that really had nothing to do, you know, much like watching YouTube today, had nothing to do with the next one. They didn't really tell a single narrative, but it was a great business for Edison and Eastman. You know, they were kind of making the hardware and the software. It was like Intel and Microsoft kind of rolled up all in, all in one. This is what Thomas Edison said when someone started talking about, let's develop movie projectors. He said, we're making a lot these peep show machines and selling a lot of them at a good profit. If we put out a projector, there'll be used for maybe about 10 of them in the United States. So as soon as you had a movie industry in existence, you had Edison, who really helped invent it, saying, okay, let's stop right here. You know, let's stop innovating. We've got a great business. Uh, 
today, which is really, uh, really fascinating because we all think of Edison as like the paramount guru inventor uh, of America, but he actually had these moments where he was saying, you know, let's, let's stop innovating now. I want to jump ahead to, uh, to 1927 here. Uh, listen, I'm going to sing this like I will if I go on the stage, you know, with this show. I'm going to sing it jazzy. Now get this. Blue sky, smiling at me, 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 me. Nothing but little blue sky, do I see? Do, 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 do. Blue bird, singing a song. Nothing but little blue bird, all day long. You like that slap business? Never saw the time. Shining so bright, never saw things going so right. Noticing the day, hurry and buy. When you're in love, oh, don't they fly. Blue day, all of them gone. Ah! Nothing but. Now, I've seen ra rabbis, and that is one angry rabbi uh, in that scene. Uh, the movie, of course, is The Jazz Singer, which everyone thinks of as like, this is the first talkie. It's the first time people tried to synchronize sound with what was going on on the screen, but it actually wasn't. People had tried to do that for the previous 10 years. It just never worked really well, and people would laugh. They would throw things at the screen. They would ask for their money back. But it was Warner Brothers and Al Jolson and The Jazz Singer that finally... Uh, got everything to come together and uh, and create talkies and the technology was really um, You know you'd call it kind of brittle. It was unreliable. You see the pro the Amplification stack in the left there, which was all new technology in the center that round thing is actually still a record player uh, And then you have the movie projector that's kind of connected with all these cables and gears to the record player So that they would stay in sync But the projectionist had this crazy job where he'd have to like put the film thread the film through the projector and start it on Exactly the right frame and then start the record on exactly the right groove And then a few times during the jazz singer would actually have to flip the record and change the record So it was kind of like juggling plates, but it just barely worked the jazz singer was the biggest success that Hollywood had had up to that point. And literally for about a year, people were lining up around the block from every movie theater that played the jazz singer, waiting to see it and then going to see it again. And in the 1920s, you had movie studios that had been established in Hollywood and you had movie moguls, um, you know, who got rich making movies. And here's what they said about the success of the jazz singer. The second one is really interesting. I believe the time will never come when the outstanding silent pictures will be out of the market. So there's always this idea when something new comes along that it will coexist with the old technology, you know, that the two things can exist peacefully and, and it's not one thing displacing the other. And I don't know when the last time you saw a silent movie was. They don't come along uh, very often. I think the artist, you know, every 20 years someone will make a movie that, I that is a silent movie almost as an homage to the past. But Let's just say that most of Hollywood's revenues in 2013 don't, uh, don't still come from silent pictures. I'm going to jump ahead. I have lots of examples that I love to show, but I'm going to jump ahead here to 1967. And the, uh, the star of this next scene later went on to play Rain Man and Ben Stiller's dad. I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, sir, you. Yeah. Plastics. Exactly. How do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? Yes, I will. I've said. So the movie is The Graduate. Have you seen The Graduate, some of you? It's a fantastic movie, the very beginning of Dustin Hoffman's career. And though it came out in 1967, what happened in 1977 is there was this entrepreneur in Michigan named Andre Blay who had absolutely nothing to do, no connection in the movie industry at all, but he started to see that there were these video cassette players coming out of Japan made by, uh, some of them made by Sony, called the Betamax, and he said, I'm gonna license a bunch of movies. He got Fox to agree to give him 50 movies, including The Graduate, to start selling on videotape, and it took off like a rocket. It was, it was just a crazy success, and Fox actually bought his company after about a year of selling movies on videotape. But Hollywood, while they loved the idea of like our product being sold on these videotapes and consumers could watch movies uh, in a new place uh, in, their, in their homes, they didn't actually like the idea of the blank videotape and that you would put it in your Betamax or your VCR and you would be able to record their TV shows and their movies and do what this ad says, watch whatever, whenever. Uh, and they hated that idea so much uh, that they filed a lawsuit against Sony that went all the way up to the Supreme Court, basically just trying to, 
to stop it or tax VCRs and videotapes, you know, sort of put the movie industry tax so that you'd pay a little bit extra that would go to the movie industry. Uh, and this is a great quote. Around the time that this whole legal battle was happening, Jack Valenti, who was the head of the Motion Picture Association, went in front of Congress and uh, said this. So basically, he told Congress that the VCR is going to kill the American film industry. Oh, and it's going to—it's dangerous to the American public somehow too. Um, and you know, we need to stamp this out, or we need to just tax it and get our money out of the VCR. Well, it's lucky that the movie industry actually lost this case when it went to the Supreme Court, because eight years after Valenti said that, they were making more money from home video sales and rentals than they were making from selling movie tickets. So this is an incredible example to me that innovations that can sometimes really look threatening and really look like they're going to take a piece out of your business actually reinvigorate and revive and kind of save a business that uh, the movies in the 80s really had been hurt by television and other forms of entertainment. You know, video games were starting to appear, and home video was really, uh, really a godsend. We're going to skip ahead now to 2006, uh, around the time that three guys in Silicon Valley started a new website. Evolution of dicks. <laughs> I wish I could show you the whole six minutes of, of that, but uh, Evolution of Dance was really the first viral video after YouTube launched. YouTube launched in 2005. This was uploaded in early 2006. And I remember spending time in Los Angeles at this point talking to people in the movie industry, and they'd say, like, it's so low quality. Like, the sound is bad. The picture's bad. Like, look at this. There's only one camera. There's no editing. There's no special effects. And they kind of didn't get why YouTube was going to be important. But look at the number of views. When I downloaded, uh, captured this video, it had 100 million views. Today, if you go and look at it, it's 213 million views uh, of Evolution of Dance which is far more than the, the highest rated episode of Seinfeld ever had when it was bro broadcast on NBC. Pretty amazing. Uh, and then here's Sumner Redstone, who owns CBS and owns Comedy Central and owns Paramount Pictures, what he says about YouTube. You can't pay the rent posting videos on YouTube. This is not going to become a business. He basically was making the case that it's all people stealing his copyrighted content and uploading The Daily Show and uploading Saturday Night Live to YouTube. Uh, and he actually then filed a lawsuit, which is still pending, uh, against YouTube and its new owner, Google. But this is the, hot, the movie industry saying, we don't see how this is going to be a business model here, uh, or anyone's going to make money. And within a few years, I was interviewing people like Michael Buckley, who was working a desk job uh, in suburban Connecticut. He was working for Live Nation, the concert promoter. Uh, and he started this entertainment show, which was like a catty, gay version of Entertainment Tonight, like lots of gossip, lots of coverage of reality shows and celebrities. And he started making more money from the advertising revenue that YouTube was sharing than he was making at his day job. So he quit. Uh, and HBO gave him a development deal. Last year, YouTube committed to, to spending $350 million on original content, uh, which is not chopped liver even by the movie industry's uh, accounting. So it's really incredible when you look back at this uh, more than 100-year history of Hollywood and innovation. And I think that the big message that if I were to summarize it in a tweet, it's that it's kind of a lie that people want innovation or like innovation. People fight innovation a lot of the time. And what I learned in writing this book is that there are really these three groups of people in any industry. You have the innovators who are doing new stuff and promoting new stuff and love innovation. You have the preservationists, as I call them, who are people who are just diehard, like dedicated to like keeping things the way they are, preserving the status quo. And the largest group of people are the sideline sitters. They're just sort of waiting 
you know, they want to go to work every day, they want to collect their paycheck, uh, they're just waiting to see who wins, you know, and when they're forced to change, they'll make the change, but not before. I think it's interesting that um, what you see is that it, if no one's fighting your idea or telling you why it can't work, it may not be so big an idea. It may not be a really transformational idea. You also notice that a lot of innovators underestimate how much time it's going to take and how many friends and allies they're going to need out there in the world to help their breakthrough ideas get adopted and get embraced by people. Uh, it's not just about having a great product that everyone's going to understand and suddenly buy tomorrow because it's been demonstrated to them today. And I want to wrap up with two quotes that come from the book project that I wound up uh, writing. One from George Lucas who says of the establishment that when they're confronted with something new, they can come up with reasons why it can go wrong, but it's very hard for them to understand or come up with any reasons why it's the right thing to do. And I think you see this a lot when you have a new idea and you're dealing with someone who's very negative. They couldn't possibly see a scenario where, where your idea is going to work and win out. This is another great innovator uh, from the movie industry, James Cameron, who made Titanic and Avatar, two of the most successful movies of all time. And he's really a dyed-in-the-wool innovator. He says, what haven't you done yet? That's the only interesting thing to be doing. That's what gets me up in the morning. But I think you have to acknowledge that the whole world, it's a very small, small, small percentage of people on the face of the earth that feel like that, you know, that wake up every morning to innovate and to think new thoughts and to design new things. Um, I think... Many of you are in this room uh, or watching on the simulcast, and I wish you all great luck in introducing your breakthrough ideas. Before I wrap up, I want to thank the amazing organizers of TEDx UMass, uh, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks.